I always love the feeling of seeing something in media that is so deep in the back of your brain. Just seeing a few frames of it can send your mind into this crazy frenzy of, whoa, what the fuck? I remember that. I don't know if nostalgia is the right word because that sort of implies you had a positive experience with it and enjoy remembering it. What I'm talking about is something deeper, some weird set of neurons in the back corner of your brain that haven't fired in that one certain way in who knows how long. But still, whatever sets it off, you recognize it. It's a subjective thing, of course. One person's back corner of the brain shows usually only line up with people who share their age and demographic. Graphic. And even then, it's hard to find a piece of media that hits just as hard for one as it does for the other. Usually, and I find for most people, it's cartoons. Probably because you were a kid when you were watching them, and your brain wasn't fully formed yet, and your brain was like, yeah, I should probably cordon off a little area here so I can remember this shit in 20 years. Brain didn't know any better. Brain was still trying to figure out what was important information and what wasn't. So today, I'm gonna quickly talk about some old shows that at one point, I didn't know I remembered. And maybe I'll activate that crazy feeling of rediscovering something you barely recognize for you too. Or maybe not, but maybe you'll find a cool new old show to watch. Or maybe you just like hearing me talk. Who knows? All right, let's go. First up, Cyber Six. The show kind of messed me up as a kid. It was always on just a little past bedtime, and it was just such a weird show tonally compared to everything else that was on the same network. So I knew the show wasn't made for me, even though at the end of the day, it was a cartoon. And I knew there were cartoons that weren't made for kids, like, I don't know, Family Guy or something. But this one was different. This one was dark and serious, and the art was weird, and the animation was pretty solid. The only other piece of media I saw as a kid that really gave me that feel was whenever I saw a few moments of a Kira, and I was like, oh, this is kind of scary and weird, so I just turned it off. But with Cyber 6, I didn't turn it off. I watched, I think, every episode at one point or another when I was a kid, which was easy, because there was only 12. And you know why I didn't turn it off like Akira? Because the opening is such a fucking heater. In the depths of my soul, I know we will survive. I should mention, Cyber 6 is based off an Argentinian comic of the same name, which really doesn't share the same vibe as the show. A lot of nudity and death in that comic. Comparatively, the cartoon is very, very tame. So what is Cyber 6 about? Well, it's pretty wild, actually. I'm glad you asked. I'm happy to get into it. You join the main character, Adrian slash Cyber 6, at a weird transitioning point in their life. You'll see what I did there after this next sentence. They're just starting a job as a high school literature teacher, but they're moonlighting as a male alter ego named Adrian Seidelman, when they're actually biologically female. The show never really goes into why they do that, maybe they just think it's a better cover. And I mean, they pull it off really good, got me fooled. Anyway, that's the deal. They're Adrian by day and the super heroine persona Cyber Six by night. That was a really interesting little wrinkle to my child brain. Even with it being a lot more mainstream now, you still don't really see the main characters of shows playing around with gender and it being like a big ongoing plot point. And this was the early 2000s, so it was really novel. Outside of that though, the show is pretty meat and potatoes. There's an evil scientist that makes monsters to wreak havoc on the strange, gothic, architectured, fictional city of Meridian and Cyber 6 has to handle whatever he throws at them. Usually by jumping on them, strangely. I don't know if there was some studio agreement or something, but man, not a lot of punches thrown in this adult-oriented cartoon. Mostly they just jump on the monsters. Oh, which is like, that's your signature attack, Cyber 6? You do the Goomba stomp? And unfortunately, some animation does get reused, but respectfully sparingly. She's not doing the same jump attack every episode, and when an animation is reused, it's usually a good handful of episodes apart, so you don't really notice so much. It's very Monster of the Week when it comes to action, there's no real overarching story here, but I don't think that's where this show does its best work, actually. There's a bit more of a fluid story in the normal, everyday life of Adrian Seidelman. They have a colleague at work named Lucas, who Adrian is great friends with. They go to this lovely little bistro after work a lot, it's very cute. But Lucas always seems to find himself getting caught up in Cyber 6's messes. And unbeknownst to him, of course, Cyber 6 is his buddy Adrian. All the same, Lucas finds himself romantically interested in Cyber 6, and Cyber 6 has to wrestle with the fact that they kind of feel the same way. But at the same time, they're friends in a completely different regard that Lucas doesn't even know about, and like, how do you deal with that? It's very interesting. And Lucas plays a big part too, he's not just some love interest, he's really a main character. He gets in there during fights, makes plans, he's a good character. And there are other characters from the everyday life of Adrian that get mixed up into things too, like the street rat Julian, or this really overbearing girl named Lori from class that actually has a crush on the Adrian alter ego. Weird, yeah, I know, I know man, fucking, I didn't write this shit. Oh, also, her kid brother is a panther now after he fell off a cliff. I think the weakest part of the show was actually the villains. The Monster of the Week thing, I can take it or leave it. None of them are super interesting. You get classic ones like werewolves and gargoyles, but you also get this big D&D monster and this weird deviant art creation too, but they never do anything that really surprises you. Paradoxically, the episode with the deviant art villain might be the worst episode, but the villain might be the best enemy from a character viewpoint. But best doesn't really mean much here. Most of the monsters are forces of nature that the characters have to go up against, and while that's cool once in a while, sometimes I want to cut my teeth on something a little more juicy. You would hope that's where the mad scientist comes 
comes in, right? He gets to be the interesting one. Ah, uh, no, actually, you're wrong. He's the biggest, baddest guy in the show, but he doesn't actually get any screen time. The actual acting villain is his annoying-ass son, Jose. I get the idea that a good villain is one that you hate, but I think you have to love to hate them on some level, too. I just fucking hate this kid. He's just annoying. Everything is yelling and screaming, and he's just a spoiled kid in a not very interesting way. So the combination of not-so-interesting monsters being commanded by a villain I don't care about and sigh violently whenever he shows up on screen adds up to an aspect of the show that I would definitely say is a negative. And that's the thing. This video is about shows I just barely remember, and after watching it all the way through, I'm actually not the biggest fan of Cyber 6. I mean, it's alright. I really like the Lucas romance plot. I think that's really interesting. But past that, the show is pretty painfully average. Nothing really stands out. And like I said, you're just sort of plopped into the situation where it's all kicking off. You never get into Cyber 6's backstory, you never learn what they're about or why they have superpowers or who the evil scientist even is or why he's doing the things he's doing. And without that, why do I care? I like the characters, but it's missing some very needed storytelling. Why do I care about the civilians of the weirdly sparsely populated city of Meridiana? Why is Cyber 6 named Cyber 6? Are there other Cybers? Who could say? I guess the wiki could, or the comic, but the show definitely falls flat there. Overall, I don't know, this kind of turned into a review somehow, that wasn't really my intention, but whatever. I think Cyber 6 is pretty middling, but I reckon some people could really fuck with it if they gave it a go. Speaking of shows you barely remember, remember that episode of Katie and Orby where Orby got the cops called on him for making mustard gas in the basement, and he had a standoff with police for 16 hours while holding Katie hostage? That episode was fucked up, I can't believe they actually released that. Just to highlight what I mean by the demographics making a big difference here, one time I was streaming on YouTube, subscribe by the way, oh my fucking god, and I brought up this topic to chat and someone got me to put on the Liberties Kids opening. And I gotta say, it's a little bit of a bop, not quite Cyber 6, but you know. Being a non-American, this show was not available to me in my youth, but a lot of people in the chat popped off like, oh shit, I remember this, and that's exactly what we're going for. You'll find that this video is actually an enormous ploy for comments for people to post their own barely remembered shows so I can look them up and see if I can get my fix for the feeling again. I need it. I need it. Okay, what else? Remember fucking Redwall? That super weird medieval mouse show? I super barely remember this one. I know this farm boy, princess, bright ass mouse is destined to become the knight of legend or whatever, and it all takes place in this weirdo little kingdom that's made up of all your woodland critters. I so don't remember this one. I don't even remember the characters' names. Is... Is the main guy Redwall? No, I bet the kingdom is Redwall, right? That makes more sense. I actually took the time to watch Cyber 6, but I'm having fun just trying to remember this one from sheer force of will. There's this big badger lady, for some reason she sticks in my head. I think they were running in the attic of a church or something once, and there was an owl in there. And I think there was a girl love interest mouse. Other than that, the one scene I remember is what I have to assume is in the finale episode. So if you're the one person in the entire universe that's halfway through watching Redwall at the moment, maybe skip to me talking about the next show. I remember, and maybe Maybe I'm wrong, but the hero mouse is wielding the shining sword of mouse legend or whatever and is knocked flat on his back in his pit during like a big war or something. And the evil villain rat also falls into the pit for some reason and skewers himself on the hero's sword. To which if I'm wrong, you'll be watching what actually happens in the show on screen now, which is funny I think. Anyway, I think that's an interesting way to have the hero not straight up kill the villain in a kid's show, but still have them get horribly gored to death. Which is what most Teletoon viewers were looking for, I'm pretty sure. I remember reading the reviews in the elementary school newspaper. And and most people were very satisfied with the rat impalement. I guess it's one way to get your kind of bad mouse show to stick in someone's head. Worked on me. You know what? I'm having a hell of a time trying to find a way to transition between talking about shows. Not a lot of through lines on the random shows my brain remembers, it turns out. Fuck, man, I had it easy when I was talking about Avatar. I got that show like the back of my hand. I was thinking about doing a video with Avatar trivia somehow, but I can't figure out how to do it. I'd have to host like a game show or something. I couldn't compete. You'd all be paper cranes in the storm that is overanalyzing Avatar. Oh, would you Look at that, I've expertly gotten off of topic so I can transition to being back on topic. Anyway, back on topic. Anyone remember Flying Rhino Junior High? I hear anything's possible over there. On the really weird to bad scale, it's probably halfway between Recess at the bottom and O'Grady at the top. No one fucking remembers O'Grady, I'll tell you that right now, no reason talking about that one. Anyway, Flying Rhino Junior High, weird, kinda bad. The kinda show you'd watch if nothing else was on, and you wouldn't sign your head that dramatically. Centers around the titular middle school and the gang of friends who go there. And the place is constantly, well, basically 
basically reality warped by this weirdo who secretly lives in the boiler room of the school who calls himself the Phantom. Which is what I nearly called and modeled my channel's branding around. Oh, what could have been? Alright, so what do I remember about this show? That's a great question. I remember this kid is named Billy O'Toole, this kid is named Ruby, and I'm 90% on this kid being named Marcus. And this kid is fucking Broomhilda for all I know. And Radicus. He's here too. This show kind of makes me feel bad, honestly, because I was clearly a very basic child. I only remember the episodes that were very stereotypically pandering hell yeah fuck yeah boy stuff. The video game episode? Banger. Probably. I remember it at least. The dinosaur episode? That shit was very mint and quite cherry. Also, there was an episode with Frankenstein, I remember, where I think they did Frankenstein. Well, if it's Frankenstein, it would have been weird if they did Dracula, I guess. That's what I mean, though. Video games and dinosaurs and Frankensteins? Man, couldn't younger me have been any cooler? I wish I was into, like, darts or politics. But yeah, the show was very ugh, I recall. It just didn't have the writing of something that felt genuinely entertaining, like Recess or, I don't know, The Weekenders. Even though you think it would, since those shows are very grounded in comparison. But maybe that's what makes them work. It feels like real kids dealing with semi-believable real kid problems. So I could relate, you know? With this show, it's so out of this world, I can't find reasons to vibe with these characters like I can with my main man, Tino. Man, I'm really putting this show through the ringer. Yeah, you know what? Fuck Flying Rhino Jr. High. You heard it here first. So, that was my scatterbrain idea for a video on shows I barely remember. I don't really know how this video turned out. Was it better that I actually watched Cyber 6 so it could give a more informed review? Or was it funnier for me to try and brute force memories out of my brain? Let me know in a comment or something. And actually, for real, tell me the shows that you just barely remember. Because you might just jog someone else's memory when they're reading the comments, and that's the goal here. I can make a little series out of this if people like the idea, talk about super obscure shows. Of course, I like the idea, but let me know what you think. This is just a little experimental thing. I wanted to see how it turned out. Alright, that's it, I guess. Also, fucking subscribe or else. All right, patrons. Patron shoutouts. If you want to see two brand new videos from me, you can support me on Patreon for just a few bucks. Link, as always, is in the description below the video. Biggest shoutouts of all go to my top patrons. Agent Rhino, who got through to the second round of America's Got Talent by doing a triangle solo. Danger Stranger, who was born by emerging from a snowstorm at a Buddhist temple in the year 1800. Fred Sullivan, who went spearfishing and accidentally hit an eldritch god, but they were cool about it. Jack, who's had a dark web hit out on him for years, but is always just barely avoiding them on some Mr. Magoo type shit. Kevin Hall, who realized he was about to stub his toe once, so he just kicked straight through the wall. No way that wall was gonna get a free hit in. Omega Fighter, who went to the Oval Office and really sorted out the feng shui, and ever since America's SAT scores have been up 4%. Sean Martin, who can snap his finger so loud it could kill a house fly if it's in the same room. Stephanie Riches, who can read sign language and speak braille. Thomas Lautenbach, who rigged up a car motor to a broomstick, and he's pretty sure he can fly. Gonna try this weekend. Tiago Nascimento, who got an x-ray once, and it turns out he doesn't have bones. He's just made up of 206 smaller versions of himself. And Varunda, who in an act of cinematic espionage, changed the ending to Lost to that shit everyone hates, but they still have the original ending hidden away on a Betamax tape somewhere in their closet. And Whitrow, who has the fastest time averaged out of speedrunning Mario 64 while also running the 1500 meter race at the same time. And of course my god overanalyzers, Two Boots Are Beat, Ali QPZM, Andrew Watrett, Austin Gallup, Be My Valentine, Braden Shanahan, Brando Espinosa, Cade Stinson, Charles Burnett, Christopher D. Sampson II, Dizzy Payne, DJ Jax, Dominic Saint, Distant, Ethan Standall, Glintlock, It's Carton, Jacob Whitecotton, Jackson, John Ajaka, Josie Tiffin, Justin Fletchall, KT and Den B, Leon, Nathan William Sizemore, Nickel Pickle 582, Nicholas Abbott, Peter Bayron, Phil, Philip Conti, Reese, Rocket Mist, Ryan Maxwell, Samuel Vanderplatt, Super Snipper, Vavina Lockfire, Yozin, and the Bearface. Next up, I'm gonna talk about something a little more modern, actually. In the depths of my soul, I know he will survive. Oh man, that doesn't sound good. I should cut that.